Bill. I'm originally from uh, California, Fresno. Uh, moved up here in 99 to go to Bible college. I uh, was three years in Bible college um, until I really felt God leading me to get a, um, start getting uh, a um, career in front of me. Um, and just to go over my uh, history, I uh, come from a family of eight. I'm the youngest boy. Uh, most of my family is um, rooted in um, Oklahoma and Arkansas, um, Hugo and Adabel. And um, just growing up, um, at that time, uh, it was a dysfunctional family, which nowadays seems to be the normal family. Um, my mom worked two jobs, put herself through college. My father was a heroin addict, and he was in and out of prison um, pretty much my whole entire life. They divorced when I was about 14, and just sporadically I would just have this intermittent relationship with my dad. And so, as I grew up, um, you know, regardless of that fact of being dysfunctional, I had a great childhood. You know, even though there were things that I wish had never happened, I still say that I had a great childhood because I had a mother who loved me unconditionally. Even when I was a knucklehead and didn't have any reason to be a knucklehead, but I was one, she was always there to support me and provide for me and bailed me out of jail. Uh, once or twice. And um, graduated in 85, um, went to college, was playing football, um, had an opportunity to be a walk on for the Dallas Cowboys. Mm -hmm. And drugs messed up my life. You know, I spent maybe one year in high school playing football and I spent about a year and a half in college. And I was good. I was at the same, sea, uh, same year that uh, Refrigerator Perry was making his debut. And I was about three inches taller than he was, and I was definitely faster than he was. Yeah. You know, so I had the opportunity to go on and become a profession, professional football player. But I made certain choices of people that I hung out with that derailed that um, career prospect for my life. So I got into drugs, got more involved in drugs, became a drug dealer for about five years in Fresno and Los Angeles. Um, and that was kind of the life I was getting into um, when I actually got arrested uh, for um, sales. And I was on my way to prison. Um, at that time, in, uh, I was in Hanford, California, that's where my mom lived at. Um, <clears throat> a lot, they did, um, a lot of indictments, a lot of guys that I ran with uh, all got, we are all in jail at that one time. And basically they were doing drug diversion, which was uh, CRC, which was a drug rehab prison, which instead of getting your maximum sentence of five or ten years, you were getting an 18-month sentence or an eight-month sentence. If you confess that you were an addict. So the majority of all these drug dealers, some who I bought from, were saying, I'm addicted to crack just so they can get the eight months or 18 months off, which the court honestly didn't care. They just wanted to get the streets clean. They, didn't, they just wanted people in jail. So when it came to me, they asked me, so why were you selling drugs? And so at that very moment, I was going to say, I could say the same thing, you know, maybe do 18 months, get eight months, you know, and then, you know, be back on the streets and doing a thing. But something in my heart said, you need to tell the truth. And I was like, I've never done that, <laughs> you know. I fabricated a lot of stuff, you know, and polishing up and designing my, my street image and telling the truth was not a part of that image. So I did. I, I told him it was like the reason I was selling drugs is I couldn't find a job. Uh, I was trying to help support my mom. I was trying to, you know, <laughs> keep clothes on my back. And so all of this, and then we get to court and I get to sentencing, and the judge looks me square in the eye and says, you told the um, probation officer that you were selling drugs because you couldn't find a job. I was like, yeah. He said, 
you are the first person that has ever told the truth wow. about selling drugs. And I was like, okay. He said, he said I'm not going to send you to prison. He said, I'm going to give you uh, felony probation. You'll do six months in the county. And that was God intervening in my life. From that moment, probably three years later, six years, no, actually five years later, it was just step by step where God was continually guiding and putting me to where he wanted me to be. Eventually, I got um, a couple dirty tests for marijuana. And on the last dirty test, well, again, you know, it's like I had a violation. And, um, you know, second violation, mandatory prison, three years. I was okay with that. I accepted that. That night in my uh, cell on my bunk, I remember the prayer. I don't know if it was a prayer, if it was so much a crying out. I was like, God, I'm tired. It's like I've run in the streets. I did all of the things that I know I could do. You know, I, I hustled. That's what my thing. It wasn't just drugs. I mean, I, I could create any way that I needed to to make money. That was just my nature. You know, so and I said, God, I'm just tired of it. You know, I'm just tired of the stress, tired of the work it takes to keep this image of the street person who wasn't really me. You know, because of my size, I was always deemed that guy, you know, the enforcer, the guy you didn't want to talk to or mess with because, well, I, I God blessed me with a lot of things and, and being physical was one of them, you know, and so actually it wasn't so much an altercation as it was just a sparring match with a friend of mine who actually happened to be a fourth degree black belt. Well, I actually beat him without any training. It was just, wow. that's how physical I was. I am, I'm very good at adapting to a physical situation. That was just a gifting that I had. So that got spread around. And so not a lot of people mess with me after that. <laughs> and I think that was when I was 19, you know. And so going into this, jail cell and just reflecting on all that I had done over the last five and a half, six years. I was just like, I'm done. I'm tired. I'm willing to pay my dues, do my three years, go to prison. And I was like, but I, and I said, God, when I'm done, I just want a simple life. I want the white picket fence, the kids, the house. I just, I just want to have a good life. Uh, and I was, that was it. My mind was set, do, do my prison time, go through prison, you know, survive, you know. And um, so we get to, again, we get to sentencing, and my lawyer, and, and that was it. And I was, I was ready for them to ask, you know, do you do this and this? And yes, I accept this, I accept that, I did that. And again, I get before this judge, and he looks at me, and he was like, well, Mr. McCarty, and he was looking at, he kept going like this. I'm like, how much stuff do I have on my sheet? <laughs> I'm like, I don't think I did that much. And so he's just going, and he's looking at it. He's looking at the DA, and he's looking at, he's looking at my lawyer. And I'm just like, we're all, everyone in court was just like, what is he doing? And so he stops, and he looks at it. He's like, so, this is your second um, drug offense, um, you dirty test and everything, and the mandatory is three years in prison. I said, yes, sir. He was like, what do you think I should do with you, Mr. McCarty? It's like, no one's ever asked me that. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. I'm looking at my lawyer, and she's just, she's never had that question. And then in my mind, I said, Judge, I was in rehab once. And he's like, did it help? I said, it did help a little bit. And so he goes over, and he's doing the paper and everything. And I was just like, all right, what's going on? And so he says, okay. He said, I'm not sending you to prison. I'm like, what? He says, as soon as they have a bed open for you in this rehab, I want you to go. He's like, I'm going to give you so that you don't become too, um, uh, you know, have all your free time and, and you know, get in trouble. And he said, I'm going to give you uh, 3,000 hours of community service. It's like, okay, but I ain't going to prison, am I? He's like, no. <laughs> it's like, Okay. <laughs> I accept that. And I was just, and I walked back to the holding cell and every one of the guards just said, I have never seen that happen. Wow. 
I have never seen him do that with what I had gone through. I've never seen a judge do that with anybody. And I was like, and I was just bewildered. I was like, okay, maybe I got off. <laughs> no, Th two months later, I was in the rehab. One month later, I was saved. I, I went to a play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, and I gave my life to Christ. And that was um, April 6, 1997. And like I said, making that transition, getting into church from having that lifestyle was very, very difficult. Uh, especially with the hugging. I, my, my mother was never an affectionate person. She'd say, I love you, but I, not, not the touchy-feely type mom. You know, and um, when people were in church and they were like, hi, how you doing? And they honestly tried to reach out and hug me. I kind of do the, you know, yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> and it was just, I wasn't comfortable with that. And I just didn't understand that. But as God continued to work on me, I realized what he was doing. He had put me in the right situation with the right people, or the church that was openly expressing his love for one another. And so uh, it was probably, honestly, maybe five months later that I was able to hug without, you know, feeling all weird and stuff, <laughs> you know. But I was only saved maybe a, a year and a half before I was up here in Bible college, and God was set me on my course for what he had for my life, and so um, getting up here and even going to Bible college, and there was a time for about, about two years, I kind of walked away from